Okay then. Well, it appears that we are live for episode 22 of uh, Space Rocks Uplink. On behalf of everybody here, I just want to say a huge welcome, especially to people um, that are new faces um, to our world. I'm Alexander Milas. I'm with Space Rocks. And uh, we're all about celebrating the wonder of space exploration and the art, music, culture, film that it all inspires. I'm joined by Mark McCorkman. And uh, uh, hello, Mark, are you receiving? Yes, I am, Alex. Good to see you again. Very good. Well, uh, lovely to have you aboard. So, uh, you know, for, for people that might not have uh, caught us before, uh, I mean this in the nicest possible way. So, uh, so what do you do for a living, Mark? <laughs> when, when you're not good question. <laughs> yeah, good question these days, especially. Um, so, uh, yeah, Mark McCorkran, I'm the Senior Advisor for Science and Exploration at the European Space Agency. So that covers the science of all of the missions effectively looking outwards. Um, our telescopes looking out into the universe, our missions which go out into the solar system, but also the human exploration side and the robotic exploration side, so going to Mars and the moon. So it's a very wide remit and I get to you know play with all of this fantastic science that's there and communicate it to the scientific community, but also to the general public, which is why we work together on, on space rocks and other things. Indeed. Well, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a wonderful collaboration. And, uh, you know, I think it's uh, an obvious connection, I think, to, to anybody that's looked up the night sky and wondered what was out there. And also anyone that's looked up and felt an emotional, you know, connection as well. And I guess that's what all of this is about. And, uh, you know, 22 episodes of Uplink, certainly, and uh, our events as well. You know, it's been remarkable, the kind of combinations of people and experiences um, we've been able to bring together under one roof. Yeah, I think that's true. As you say, you know, the public, the live events that we do, um, uh, we've had to shelve them, of course, because of coronavirus for the time being. But um, Uplink has been a way of keeping continuity, of bringing new faces, new names from science. We've had, uh, uh, we won't be the first astronaut we've had on tonight. In fact, we've had one before. Um, but then musicians, artists, filmmakers, authors, um, a, a wide range of people are all inspired and equally inspiring, hopefully. So, you know, trying to bring people into the broader cultural, not just STEM, but STEAM, adding art in there to uh, science, technology, uh, engineering and, and, and uh, mathematics. And so there's, a you know, uh, a lot we can do in these crazy times uh, when we're locked down like this. Um, and uh, yeah, as you say, 22 episodes of Uplink since I think the beginning of April, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's kept me sane. Well, mostly, I think mean, you're probably a better judge of that than me, but. Uh. Indeed, well, I guess I should say, uh, well, on behalf of so many people that are uh, watching us live on YouTube, um, so say we all, uh, you know, and I guess <laughs> in some way, you know, as a fellow Battlestar fan, uh, you know, uh, you might agree with me, this is the 22nd episode, but we might've called this episode 33, just as an homage. There you go, exactly. And 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 as we've as I've said online, we will be leaving this YouTube uh, location in thirty three minutes. And if you can follow us, you're welcome to join the rest of it. But uh, um, yeah, and, and and indeed, so this evening we have two fantastic guests uh, linked in a way. And and you can see, I don't know if people can make out in the backdrop here. This is of course the Battlestar Galactica in the foreground, and then the Colonial Fleet from the uh, two thousand and four series. But I've kind of sneakily put in here the International Space Station to scale. Uh, so it's about 109 meters across. Uh, Galactica is about 1300 meters long. Um, so it's just to give a sense of where we are in real space with real astronauts versus science fiction. And indeed the two guests tonight, you know, bridge that. So we have one of ESA's own, um, Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, European astronaut of Italian origin, as we, we like to say that around here. Uh, of course, Samantha flew to the space station at the end of 2014, was there for 200 days, came back in 2015. Um, she's still in uh, in training. Uh, she's had a daughter in the meantime, uh, Kelsey, um, and she's still in training and hoping to fly. And she said earlier on, as we were talking, she won't say anything politically incorrect today uh, because she might get grounded. So I, I've got to take all of that stuff on today. <laughs> um, and our other guest is somebody that she's met, somebody that she's uh, um, been in touch with before. We, we've talked about this on Uplink before. We go to various other events, science fiction conventions and so on. There's a big one in Germany called FedCon, which we've been to a number of years in a row. And two years ago, um, it was the whole cast of Battlestar Galactica, the reimagined series from 2004. And one of the people there was our other guest this evening, Katie Sackhoff, who of course played uh, Starbuck, uh, Cara Thrace, uh, kind of um, headstrong 
hotshot fighter pilot. And Samantha's background before she joined ESA was as a fighter pilot. So we thought, how good could it get to get two of the best fighter pilots in the galaxy with space experience right here on Uplink this evening? Indeed. Uh, you know, uh, uh, what better way to uh, celebrate all the things that space can inspire than, than these two. So I guess without further ado, we should bring Samantha and Katie aboard and uh, we'll see if we can get this uh, little proverbial show on the road. Okay, I can see them emerging. They're connecting to audio. And uh, hello, Katie, how are you doing? Are you receiving? I am, hi. Fantastic. Hi, Katie. Hi, Welcome. Sam. Hello. Hello, Samantha, are you receiving okay? Yes, I oh. am. Fantastic. Well, um, well, Mark and I, we were just talking about, uh, well, kind of some of the background for all of this and, uh, you know, just how your experiences are so very different, but also intertwined. And so I just wanted to, Samantha, start with a big broad question and forgive me for putting you on the spot, but, you know, you're a trained fighter pilot as well as an astronaut, of course. Um, you have spent uh, 199, 200 days in orbit. And so do you ever watch a show like Battlestar Galactica and kind of go, you know what? That's not how we do it. <laughs> well, first of all, I, ha I have to tell you, I actually watched Battlestar Galactica in space in between 2014 and 2015. Uh, and, and I loved it. I, I, I really did. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, I used to watch a lot of TV when I was a kid and, and a young person, um, but I've, 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 I've watched very little TV, um, you know, in, in my adult life. Um, and so, believe it or not, in 2014, I have not seen Battlestar Galactica yet. And everybody was like recommending it. It was like, oh, you have to. <laughs> and I, I definitely wanted a sci-fi show. And, and everybody was saying, well, you have to watch Battlestar Galactica. And I'm, I'm really happy that I, um, that I um, chose that one. So what, what happens is that you can ask the people on the ground to send you a, a TV show, kind of like an episode per day. That's kind of something that crew members like to do because we have to work out every day. And part of the working out is, is cardio. And so you're either on the bike, but most of the time you're on the treadmill and, and you've got this pretty painful harness that you have to wear because guess what we're weightless right so you, if you were just trying to run on a treadmill at the first step you would just float off which is kind of defeats the point <laughs> um so we, we've got this harness that we wear that kind of presses us down on the treadmill and so you're trying to get as close as possible to your actual weight um although you know i, I don't think i ever got past 70 percent um, and, and that's pressing it down on your shoulders and your uh, hips. And it's, it, it's, it's a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, it's not super comfortable. Sometimes it can even be a bit painful. And so people want something to distract them. And most of the time you ask for a TV show and it kind of, you know, it's like a 40 minute TV show kind of runs the length of your cardio workout. And so that's, uh, that's what I did. Mm. And, and, and I loved it. And I, I actually <laughs> did not have the feeling, well, you know, of course it's sci-fi, right? So, you know, none of that happens in real life. But in terms of like, um, you know, being a, a, a combat pilot, which is something that I did for relatively short time in my life, I was very much at the beginning of my career as a combat pilot when I was selected to become an astronaut. But still, I think I got a pretty good feeling of the lifestyle, the way people interact with each other, the jargon, you know, some of the tasks that, that you are called upon, you know, the missions that you go off and fly. And it, it didn't ring as fake at all. Actually, it felt like probably a fighter pilot was consulting for the show. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask that question exactly. Katie, did you, I mean, you know, you, you came across in that show as, you know, this was your life. This is what you had done. You'd been through everything and you were trained. Did you spend time with, with people who actually, you know, did you go to combat school somewhere or bring in some advisors who said, no, no, you've got to chew your cigar this way, not the other way? Uh, we definitely we definitely had military advisors on the show and we also had a space advisor on the show, um, which was great. Um, and they sent us to boot camp in the beginning which was kind of fun. So we had like a three day um, after boot camp, um, which is really interesting. But no, I mean, nobody really, that camaraderie I think is the thing that you feel the most. And that camaraderie is, is you know, built slowly over time um, and, and 
at the beginning, it's pretty much just acting. But, you know, as we go along, you see that camaraderie, you see the friendships building and the, that close knit family. And that was something that that took time. And I think that that's that's sort of what you see the most between us on Battlestar Galactica, that we all really loved spending time together. And that was very authentic. Um, and then other than that, you know, I, I grew up uh, my dad was served in the military. My many of my family members served in the military, and so I've always heard these stories and these these you know uh, sometimes over the dinner table, sometimes not appropriate for the dinner table. But <laughs> I always heard these stories about sort of like you know what war was like and the things that that soldiers did in their downtime, and and um, I, I pulled a lot from that bravado that. Um, that I, I sort of got from my father, even though he had absolutely none of that, I don't think. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, but I pulled from him very much so for that. So I, I, before Alex jumps in with the next sort of le le question, I just want to check back, of course, Samantha, you're famous for not not actually, you know, Battlestar Galactica, you may have seen it on, on the station. And I watched Battlestar Galactica, I, it feels a bit pathetic now. I watched most of it on my bike training and the trainer in the next room. I mean, it wasn't in zero G, but at least it was on a trainer. Um, <laughs> but but famously on on the space station, you also had a, a Star Trek uniform. So that's you know you're a big fan of that. And um, tell us a little bit about how that came about and and you know your your kind of salute to Janeway, Captain Janeway, and so on, which you did there. Yes. So um, yeah, I, I grew up as as a big, big Star Trek fan. Uh, it was very much a big part of my life, you know, big passion as, as a kid and as a teenager and, and a young woman especially. And, uh, but I also grew up in this uh, small village in, in the Alps in Italy. And um, first of all, back then when I was growing up in the 80s, early 90s, Star Trek wasn't that well known in Italy. It wasn't this big thing that it was in other countries like the US or even Germany. Um, plus, again, you know, I, I, wasn't, I was in this uh, somewhat uh, remote setting where obviously you don't have access to like big bookstores or fan stores and, and, and stuff like that. So I was one of those kids who was like, you know, uh, scouting for anything that you could possibly find or staying up at night until two o'clock because they would run like a rerun of the 60s <laughs> series. Or, you know, when the next generation actually finally, finally came to Italy, which it did a few years later than it first aired in the US, I believe, it was shown like really late at night. And <laughs> I was like, you know, staying up to watch it. Um, and then in 94, in 1994, I was 17 years old, I went to the US as an exchange student and I thought I had died and come to heaven because <laughs> Star Trek was like all over the place, you know, there was like the next generation was rerunning on TV like for two hours every day, I like hijacked the TV for those two hours. <laughs> and, <laughs> You know, Deep Space Nine was running and you can, you know, get all kinds of, uh, you know, fan stuff and uh, merchandising and, you know, it was just awesome. And then in January 2015, which was, uh, sorry, 95, which was part of my exchange year, uh, Voyager aired for the first time. And, and so I had this, this memory of like, wow, for the first time, I'm actually watching a new Star Trek show the, the day that it's actually debuting and not like years later. <laughs> um, and plus, of course, you know, it, it had a female captain, which for me as a, you know, as a, as a teenager who was obviously a girl and, and uh, obviously very interesting in, in sci-fi and tech and in space, um, that was a big deal. And, and so I, you know, Fast forward 20 years later, I'm an astronaut, I'm flying into space, and I happen to be in space on the 20th anniversary of that momentous day when Voyager <laughs> is. And, you know, and, and so I thought I, I, I would want to honor that in, in some way. And uh, I, I even tried to reach out to, uh, to Kate McGraw, who's, of course, the, the, uh, the actor who plays um, Janeway. Uh, that didn't quite work out, but um, uh, still, you know, I, I had this Voyager uniform with me, and uh, 
um, and I went to do something special with it. And I was like a, a, a friend of, of mine. His name is Paolo Tivissimo, in fact, I'm pretty sure he's listening. <laughs> and he's actually the one who gave me the suggestion. It's like, well, you're getting the coffee machine. And, you know, January was, of course, a big coffee drinker. And, and, and so I, I took that shot in the cupola with the spaceship, the cargo ship that just arrived, the dragon with the, um, with the coffee machine in its, uh, in its belly. Uh, so, and then a second one, like drinking coffee from the zero G cup with the, with the January uniform. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we, we're a serious space agency, right? Right. We, we do real <laughs> things out there. Coffee in a Star Trek uniform. What the hell? <laughs> Don't give away the secrets. Yeah, most of the time it work, but, <laughs> but don't tell anybody. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and crucially, you get cable TV as well, you know? Um, I mean, I guess uh, you might have read it here first. I mean, Battlestar Galactica, a show set in space that has actually been watched in space as well, which at some level is utterly mind-blowing to me. Um, <laughs> Isn't it? It's so cool. Yeah, um, I'm hoping that you don't watch things like The Thing on the space station. I mean, you know, <laughs> can you watch, you know, sort of haunted house horror movies on the station? What a bad idea that oh would be, Oh, my right? God. <laughs> Horrible. That would be the you, worst you thing ever. I don't even know what the thing is. But uh, you, no, good. Keep it. Keep it that way. Keep it that way. All right. Okay. Horror movie. Don't watch it. Yeah. I don't watch horror movies. I'm no, no, it's not. It's not. It's not adult, but it's scary. It, yeah, no, no, the horror. Is scary. I, don't, I don't watch horror. Oh, horror. Movies, right. I don't like to be yeah. scared. <laughs> um, I, I wondered if we could flip back just a little bit to uh, something that Katie said um, earlier about the the kind of human bonds that form, you know, um, under duress. And in stress, and and not only because of the role that you played, Katie, but also, um, you know, what we've read, and yeah, you know, we spent some time with Tamo and uh, uh, Trisha, of course, talking about the incredible connection that the cast of Battlestar Galactica seemed to have when you weren't on camera as well. And you know, I I, I guess that's so important, I think, for actors to have for chemistry. But also, Samantha, I wondered if you would then add, what is the chemistry aboard the space station as well? So starting starting with Katie, I mean, tell us a little bit about that that familial bond. You know, I, I don't think it can't be helped when you're spending so much time with people. You know, you're spending, you know, 12 to 18 hours a day for five years with people. You know, you you do form tremendous bonds. You know, I spent more time as an adult with the people of Battlestar Galactica than I did my own family. Um, and so, it, it, you know, we, we formed a bond that, that will last forever. You know, the same thing also happened on Longmire. Um, just, you know, just out of sheer proximity, when you spend that much time with people, you, you are forced to focus on your commonality and, and the things that, that, that bond you other than your differences. And, and it's just like family. It's that you end up loving those people, you know, because and and it it the bonds last forever you had of course you know there the were tensions built into the series as well so how did you how do you overcome being good friends and families when in fact there are lots of tensions built into the program i mean you know i yeah. you know i think of of um you know, poor, poor Baltar. I mean, poor guy, right? I mean, you know, you must have, you must still hate him. No, I mean, but maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sure James, James, we, we've, you know, James wants to come on the show at some point as well. So we'll ask him then, but you know. In it's Mark, difficult. Yeah. Right? actors, right? I, they don't really well, hate yeah, each but, other. <laughs> no, for sure, for sure. Well, I, I, we, we've had some actors on who are only too happy to get away from the cast after the end of the well, show. And I have had those projects too, don't get me wrong. There are definitely some, some casts that I ran away from very quickly, <laughs> but um, not, not all the casts, but there's always that, there's always one person. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that with Battlestar, when it ended, it ended in the right time for me. You know, uh, Starbuck was such an emotional, angst ridden, character that had so many demons and her demons and her vulnerability what were what it made her such a great soldier but it was very hard to go into that place as an actor and live in that 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 emotional state for five years straight and and not have it have some effect on me when I went home every night um I'm very good at shutting it off but there were some scenes that that I just had a really hard time letting go of um you know, this scene with, um, uh, there were many scenes with Baltar, or not Baltar, sorry, with Leoben, where I, you know, carried that, those scenes home because they were so emotionally violent. 
Um, and you just, it was time to say goodbye to that, that character for me, for sure. Not the cast, <laughs> but the <Yeah>. character. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I have to wonder if there is a kind of like a shared, um, you know, experience um, between you two, because I guess so many ways, um, Samantha, I mean, you, you, to be in such incredible close proximity to people, you know, and the kind of, I guess, the trust, uh, you know, and the belief in other people's capabilities that you have to have in order, I guess, function day to day, it must be, you know, beyond what most people, you know, kind of experience. I wonder if we could explore that a little bit, because the, the psychology of being aboard the space station is, is just so interesting. Right, yeah, it, it, it's interesting also listening to Kati because it's it, it's quite different. I mean, you, you obviously get the same type of camaraderie and bonding and, you know, this feeling of, you know, belonging to a family more than friendship, really, because, you know, friendship is something that, you know, you, you choose your friends and it's usually based on some kind of um, kinship from, you know, coming from your view of life or whatever it is. It's not necessarily happens with astronauts, right? You know, I, I was on board with people who had a very different view on, on, on life. And, and, and so I, I think we end, you know, we, we, we came out of the mission being more family than friends. You know, family is more something that you don't necessarily choose, but you have that strong bond that is going to last forever. You know, familiarity, this feeling of having a common investment, of having shared a very special um, experience. But it was never emotionally uh, intense, like what uh, uh, Kati was describing. I mean, I, I would say the atmosphere on the space station was very lighthearted most of the time. Um, I, I, lots of humor, lots of laughing together. Um, you know, and I think there was a feeling that, I, I don't know if it was conscious, or probably it was more unconscious, I don't know, but we, you know, we were all trying to keep it as lighthearted as possible, maybe to, to prevent and, you know, make sure that there was never any kind of tension or nobody would hold a grudge or anything or uh, nobody would feel uncomfortable because you, you, you really have an investment about everybody feeling well, you know, you cannot, you cannot go anywhere, you know, you, you, you're there for uh, several months all, all together. So I think, yeah, the, there is that investment into having a, a good, lighthearted, harmonious atmosphere on, on space station. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, depending on the character of the people that might work out better or, or less good. But in our case, I think, you know, most of the time that was really the, the case. Did you ever go for a spacewalk just for some time alone? <laughs> <laughs> So like, I'm, going, a, I'm going for a walk. I'm going for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I, doing a spacewalk was like a, a dream of mine. I really wanted to, and uh, <laughs> I didn't have a chance to do one. Oh. Uh, it's not my first mission. Uh, but it's not. It's definitely not something where you say, I'm, I, I'm just, <laughs> you know, going out for a walk after dinner. You know, it, it's very, very complex. And, yeah. And, <laughs> there's some, you know, measure of danger involved. And um so yeah it, it, there's a lot of uh, lots of people putting a lot of effort on station and on the ground i would imagine to yeah. have if we're out of space that, <laughs> that is one of the that is one of the differences i know like on my new show i'm like i'm going outside and like you're outside in 30 seconds <laughs> yeah i, I, want yeah, to, I wanted was, to pick up on nice. I wanted to pick up on something you said there, Samantha, because people don't often, you know, um, they don't realize that, of course, you're in rotation. So there's three go up, typically three up. You meet three who are already there. They leave at some point. You're there. The next three come up. So it's not a completely bonded crew. And of course, you're all generalists as well. You've all got basically, to some extent, all the skills needed to run everything on the station in, in, a, in a broad sense. Whereas when we go to Mars, let's say, it's a long mission, you're going to have specialists, you're going to have like you have in Galactica, where you're going to have, you know, you're going to have a flight surgeon, probably you're going to have, maybe you're going to have one pilot or two pilots, you're going to have the scientists, that's not the way it is on station at the moment. So how do you see the training changing? Um, and also, how do you build a crew that you know, you're going to be able to function with for, for two years? Um, I mean, it's, it's a difficult one, because on station, it's different, right? Yes, yes, it's definitely different. I, I think it will probably start even with the selection. Um, 
you know, maybe they will also have to select different psychological profiles. I, uh, I don't know if I, you know, if, 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 I'm, if I'm looking, for example, at those uh, long, uh, long term isolation studies and the, the crew members that are typically selected for that, I, I, I cannot really describe or find the right words to, to describe what I'm trying to say, but I do think that they're overall a bit different than the people that are currently selected to be astronauts. So I'm wondering whether we as, as a group, as a current uh, population of astronauts <laughs> are, you know, are, are well adapted and well selected, and I think we are for psychologically for, for space station, but they will have to look for a slightly different type when, when you're talking about this very long mission to, to Mars. Um, you know, maybe focusing even more than you do nowadays for space station on, on the fact that, you know, they're, they're going to have to get along for a very long time. Um, they might also be bored. I mean, you know, because it, it's a very long trip and there won't be that much to do on the way to Mars, right? Yeah. Because it's, yeah. it's going to be probably a minimal spaceship, you know, just to get the job done of getting them there on the planet. And there's obviously going to be a lot of excitement and, uh, you know, a lot to do once you're there. But if indeed it, it remains like, you know, you're, it's kind of envisioned right now, a, a long, uh, very long trip, then, you know, inevitably you won't have much to do. And well, then you, I'm you, wondering you can, if you can watch, the, the current you can watch Galactica 20 was, times, right? Huh? Yeah, you can but watching I mean, Galactica I, I, endlessly. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I, I'd say most people, you know, myself, and I, I'd say most people in the community right now, we we don't do very well with boredom. So you probably mm. have to fix that. <laughs> well, I think right now more than ever, that's been very evident. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other the other thing which you know I've been thinking about and talking to Frank, your you know your boss there uh, at the astronaut center, um, is, is that firstly the boredom. You know, because it's it's not a machine equipped for science in space. It's equipped for science right. when you get to Mars. So you're not going to be doing all the stuff that you do in Columbus and other modules on the station. But also, there's a huge psychological difference coming, which is the, the Earth will disappear at some point, and Mars won't be there yet. Because for every day, you can go to the cupola where you've you know you've got those pictures. You can look down. Home is just a few hundred kilometers away. Right? It's the same as Katie driving from Los Angeles to Vancouver. It's you know you can't. It's not that far. But as soon as the Earth disappears out the back of the, the, the probe to Mars, how do you think that's going to affect psychologically yeah. um, how you think about home yeah, and family and also the travel delay and everything else? Yeah, I don't, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I know that there's armies of psychologists who've tried to answer that question for, for, for many years, again, doing those isolation studies and communication delay studies and, and stuff like that. And I, I don't know if there is a consensus on the conclusion. But on the other hand, I, I would caution about making too big of a deal out of it. Because uh, historically, you know, centuries ago, people have taken off on ships and you know, they had no connection with their home country. They didn't quite know where they would end up. Uh, those were uh, trips that would last for years um, with very, very little knowledge of the environment that they were going into. Um, so I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I, I don't want to belittle this, but I also don't want it to be perceived as maybe this thing that we've never done before. Uh, yeah. Right, because I, in a way, I think it's quite similar as like taking off in a ship in the 1400s and not quite knowing where you land up and when you will find the next storm that is going to kill you. Um, uh, so yeah, maybe it's something that humans have dealt with historically. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a wonderful point. And you know, I think um, you know, uh, uh, you know, for you know not adding any kind of silver lining, but, you know, our, our current circumstances, you know, what's happening in the world, you know, um, uh, perhaps it is proof at some level of, you know, for a lot of people, you know, what we can't adapt to, you know, because this alien experience, this pandemic, something that we've never experienced before, now feels strangely familiar. I mean, horrific, unimaginable a year ago, though, you know, and now it's just part of our everyday reality at some level. And I guess, you know, bringing it back to Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica, and um, stop me if I start talking about which ship is more powerful than the other, okay? Because it's, 
I'm inspired by Mark's background there with the ISS next to, you know, I mean, that's just incredible. But, but I, I, I wonder if at some level, um, I mean, Star Trek, it kind of created like an idealized vision of what we would be like, you know, were we a spacefaring species. But Battlestar, Katie, I wondered if, if you agree or had some thoughts on this. It seemed to really explore what, what we imagined ourselves, what we'd probably really be like, right? You know, poker playing. Yeah. You know, um, you know, just like let's let's you know hide the cigars, and because there's just the day to day, just getting on with things. Well, of course. I mean, and I've said this from day one that that you know, um, Star Trek was a utopian sort of idea of of what people would be like on their best day, um, whereas Battlestar Galactica was humanity. Um, in real form, you know, people don't change who they are just because the circumstances have changed. They they take that into their new surroundings, and you know, it. it um, I I think that you know maybe some people, um, just like some people now, have a sense of responsibility and a sense of community and a sense of you know inner growth and and societal responsibility but a lot of people will continue to just do the same things that they always do and live selfishly and and just continue to be um you know um themselves no one's really going to change just because you're on a spaceship <laughs> so uh sadly Indeed, but you know um, just if i could extend that a little bit i guess this is a really salient point i suppose in in exploration you know when people talk about you know perhaps settling other worlds and so on is you know, what, what Battlestar in some sense, you know, it's almost like a metaphor is the danger of thinking that simply by going to space, our problems are left behind, you know? I mean, we, we carry them with us, you know, our, yeah. our dynamics, our issues and um, our unresolved, uh, you know, I guess inequities. Well, I think that people do that as a as a form of escapism and and sort of like as a, a protection mechanism for life that, you know, we always live in so many times people live in this when I get this, I will be this when I accomplish this. I will feel this. Um, and it's, it's, it's a way that we sort of look to the future and try not to live in in where we're at right now, but so many people live in that sort of reality of once they accomplish or attain something that they've been striving for, they realize that they're the exact same person with the exact same problems and all the same, you know, um, um, emotions that they had before. Nothing changed. They just put themselves in a different position. <clears throat> so I, I yeah. think it's the same thing. Hmm. I, I, let, let me pick up on that because it struck me, you know, I hadn't thought about it earlier, but both of you are now in positions where you go out, you know, you, you know, you, you grew up, you had, you know, normal lives, right? And now you're in a position where you go out and there's a, a whole room full of people who are projecting on you. They're projecting something on you, right? Their goals, their ambitions, their fantasies. Uh, so Katie, start with you, you know, because you, you, know, you go to science fiction conventions and of course, you know, it's a kind of a mixed crowd, right? I mean, there's, there's some people who clearly get, this is, a, this is fantasy, this is me dressing up, it's cosplay, it's fun. And occasionally I've been to some of these conventions and sometimes you think, you know, some of them actually think this is real and they ask you questions about what you've done in your role. So how do you deal with that? I mean, it is an equivalent question for Samantha, of course, but, you know, how do you deal with, you know, in a way, gently letting people down if that's what it is? Or do you just feel, say, let it go? This is, you know, your fantasy world can be real, right, for this weekend. It is funny in a sense that I think that the, the first time I got a question about how fast a Viper went, I was so confused. <laughs> Cause I felt, I felt like I should know this. Like I felt so <laughs> unintelligent in the moment. And it was like, how fast would a Viper go? How fast would a Viper go? I have, and I just like froze. And I was like, as fast as the crew can push it. Like, I don't know how fast it goes, you know, a mile Man, an so hour. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, I, I think that 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 people absolutely, because of social media, have have um, been invited not only into a character's life on a weekly basis, but to an actor's life on on a regular basis. And I think that I I, I would be remiss to not acknowledge the fact that that people do know me to a certain extent. Um, but I think that the the 
problem for me is when people think that experiences aren't shared just because somebody does something different in their life or that because, you know, um, you've accomplished something that seems unattainable, um, you are in some way not uh, normal, nor are you entitled to normal emotions because your life is so something. Um, and those are things that are like, you know, imposed on us. Like, you know, I never said, Hey, my life's so great. Like, <laughs> um, and it, it is, but it doesn't mean that we don't have the, the same struggles that everybody else has. It's all relative, you know? So uh, Samantha, for, you know, for you, it's, I mean, I, this sounds terrible. You know, where it was Katie is playing a role of having done something. So there's that extra layer. You have done these things. I know, and, that's the crazy <laughs> thing. Yeah, like... but, 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 but then it raises that issue, of course, as you said, you know, there's that projection of, you know, you've done something amazing. I could never do it. I mean, it, and in fact, statistically, it's very unlikely that most people will in the current world. So, but, you, you know, obviously they want to relate to you. They want to kind of know that it's, you're, you're an avatar in a way, right? You're an avatar in outer space for them because they probably won't achieve it. But that places responsibility as well as, you know, kind of a positivity, right? Right, right. I mean, it, 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 um, yeah, it puts you a little bit in a double bind because on the, on the one hand, you realize that that projection is, in, in many instances, is something good for people because they find it as, um, you know, they, they find you, an inspiration that it, it, you know it, it helps give them courage maybe in some difficult times in their life or inspire some choices hopefully good ones <laughs> um, on, on the other hand as, as as the person who is the object of, of all of this you you realize that a lot of it is is it's it's a projection right i mean i i know i'm not you know, I'm not the smartest, I'm not the best, I'm not the, you know, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just somebody who worked hard to, to get where I am. And I was incredibly lucky and fortunate to be at the right place at the right time. Um, and, and that's probably the biggest difference between me and, you know, probably thousands of people in Europe who could be astronauts just as well as I am. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you, you have to walk this fine line between, you know, not disappointing people, but at the same time still be faithful to truth. And yeah. it's not always yeah. so easy. <laughs> and I'm sure you get that's that question so all the, the question all the time is, you know, how do I become what you are, right? Yeah. Right, and how I mean, do you, how do you truth answer that, is, right? you know, you can, yeah, but, and, and, and unfortunately the, 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 the fair answer is you can only get ready, but then, luck and chance will make the difference between you making it or not. And of course, statistically speaking, most people will not become astronauts. But you know, what, what, what I try to tell people, because this can, can sound a little bit nihilistic, which I, I don't want it to be, and, and it shouldn't be. I mean, what, what I always tell to people, and of course I'm talking especially youngsters, is it's, it's better to have a dream and not achieve it than not having it. <laughs> You know, because that, that dream, I think, is what really pushes you to be the best person you, you can, you know, based on your circumstances and your talents and your, and your ambitions. Um, you know, as long as it doesn't become an obsession that owns you, you know, I always say you, you have to own your dream. It's not your dream that owns you, right? It's, it's two very different things. So as long as it's you owning the dream and not the opposite, then I think that's a really powerful force to make you just, you know, the, the, the best person you can be. And probably that also means you will also be the most, you know, the happiest person you can be because you, you know, you can do the most out of your life. You can most benefit your friends, your family, your community. So it, it works out for the best, even if in most cases, you will probably not achieve such unlikely dreams as becoming an astronaut or a star actor or something like that. <laughs> yeah. well, but dreams change, right? I mean, that's the thing that I find so interesting is it's, that's so great that you said that, like it, you have to have dreams, but, but those, those dreams shift, you know, like sometimes you're, you know, as you're on your way to accomplishing one thing, you realize that you actually enjoy being over here more. Yes. Um, and, and I think that that's sort of just a, one lesson in living a full life, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually, thank you for saying that because 
sometimes what, one of the things that people seem to admire <clears throat> me or other astronauts for is when we say, you know, it was our childhood dream to become an astronaut. And so people are like right. so full of admiration because they say, oh my gosh, you really stuck to it. You know, you didn't change your mind, you stuck to it and you made it. And I'm like, well, I stuck to it because it, it, it wasn't only my childhood dream. It was also my teenage dream, my grown up dream. It kind of, you know, I, as, I, as I grew up, it, I developed more mature interests that kept me on that track. But there's nothing wrong about changing your mind, right? I mean, we do not all want our six-year-old self to decide what we're going to do in our life. I mean, it's perfectly fine when you are 14, 15, 20 to say, well, bullshit, I, I'm actually made to do something else. <laughs> I, was, I was going to be a fairy police officer, by the way. I really <laughs> wanted to wear tutus and like arrest people. That was... That was what I wanted to be when I was six. So I uh, know uh, that you uh, changed your mind. <laughs> where, where, where does that where does that come from? Of... Some kind of some kind of you know, you know, uh, officer of the peace in fairyland. Where does that come from? Is it? A... <laughs> well, I I just Fern Gully was one of my favorite movies, and so I I wanted to be a fairy, but I wanted to fight okay. the good fight. So I wanted to be a fairy police officer. <laughs> <laughs> It made complete sense to a six-year-old, okay? Yeah, but I, and I'm <laughs> sure there's a Netflix happen? series there as well, right? Uh, that, I'm sure there actually already is. I think it's on Amazon. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, um, you know, I, you know, I actually wonder just, um, you know, uh, bringing in some of our audience. You know, of course, it's not just us four um, sitting, and um, you know, uh, it, it looks like we actually had. Uh, an additional bonus quadruped um, who was joining us briefly <laughs> on the, uh, the chat there as well. Was that, was that a pug there? Uh, Katie, Katie you, uh, you, 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 oh you're, God, yeah. sorry. I, you, you froze for a second and I was like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> um, <laughs> so my dog Nellie Bean is deaf and so, and she can't go down her stairs for the couch. She can go up them, but she can't go down them. And so she stands at the top and screams at you until you let her down. <laughs> And she's also a little chubby and she loves food. So she stands in the kitchen and screams at you all day long. And the reason she does it is because she can't hear anything. And so the louder she barks, the more there's a vibration. And so she barks really loud because then she knows she's barking. And um, so she screams all day long, basically. It's, really, it's, it's quite cute. She's lucky she's cute or I, you know. Yeah. She's, she's lucky. She can yeah. join up link, it is absolutely no problem. It's keeping the Battlestar uh, tradition alive because Trisha's cat just shoves its backside in the camera the entire time when she's doing uh, Zoom calls. So you get you get Trisha, you get cat backside. Trisha, cat, it's 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 good. It's good. We love it. I know. I know. Trisha's cat Fiona has put her butt in my face so many times that I never <laughs> I never thought I'd be that close to cat butts ever. <laughs> it's like every time I go to Trisha's house, I sit on the couch and I turn and there's like a butt in my face. I'm like, oh god. <laughs> Well, um, you know, uh, I wondered if I, if I could briefly um, just bring some of the audience in, because of course we have some wonderful people from all over the world um, who joined uh, us today, many for the first time. Um, you know, and uh, there is a question from Brad um, for Samantha, but I think it's so uh, so pertinent to both of your experiences, Katie and Samantha. You know, you said, you know, were you up there? Were you amazed by the view every morning, or did oh, wow. it become mundane? Because of course, I mean, you've you've got a book coming up, Samantha, right? And so. You know, I, I wondered, were you so focused on the intensity of the moment that it wasn't until you returned to Earth that you could really reflect on on what, what you were doing? And, and, you know, Katie, in many ways, I wonder if that, that experience is relatable for you as well. Mm. Yeah, so well, to answer the question directly, I mean, it, it's, um, yeah, it sounds like a commonplace, but it, indeed, you, I don't think I ever got used to it. Um, at the same time, the relationship with the view, which in the end is basically the relationship with planet Earth, it does change. I mean, at the, at the beginning, you know, you, you are this, you know, wide-eyed newcomer and, and everything is amazing and new, you know, the sunsets and the sunrises, and then you see your first aurora, and then you see the Caribbean for the first time, and then you see your first big thunderstorms, and it's all a first, um, and, and, and it's just amazing. And then as you as you are up there for you know some time you know several months then it becomes more the feeling of familiarity i mean you you, you develop this uh, 
relationship of affection with uh, with the planet and you know a lot of it becomes familiar like you know you start to recognize places um at some point we were we were having bets uh, you know we were betting with each other about who would be best at recognizing what part of earth we were overflying without looking outside just based on the color of the light that was shining through the cupola <laughs> And, yeah. and a lot of times we were able to, to you know, guess that correctly. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, the, the beauty kind of remains something that strikes you. I mean, even towards the end of my mission, I could spend, you know, a lot of time in the cupola just watching out, out and, um, you know, maybe spending an entire orbit, like one and a half hours, you know, from, from sunrise to sunrise. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, wow. But yeah, in terms of reflecting, yeah, I mean, you know, it definitely stays with you and and writing a book definitely helped me to delve back in those memories and those sensations and this feeling and, you know, trying to reconstruct them in, 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 in my mind and my spirit and then and then, of course, trying to find the right words, which is uh, which is another challenge altogether. Mm. Um, that 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 effort, if you choose to make it, which probably in hindsight, if I, if I had known going in how difficult it is to write a book, I probably would have not done it. But I didn't know. So. <laughs> I think said every person who's ever written a book, by the way. <laughs> did you did you did did you keep a diary? Is it a, is a thing that people do, or is it just too busy that you can't kind of make that space at night? Uh, uh, so, to... Some people do. I think uh, some people uh, keep uh, like a, a voice diary. They just record themselves talking. And uh, um, I, I, I did not. I mean, what I what I did was like write a blog um, at the beginning almost every day, and then I think I slowed down a bit because you know, it was getting busy up there. And um, but but I mean, what what helped me then write the book was not not only or not so much the blog but more like what I wrote to people in emails. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that goes, because the, the book actually starts with the selection. So it starts with, in 2008 and finishes in 2015. And so what I basically did not having kept a personal diary was reading, which took me a long time, but I think it was worth it. I read through every single email that I ever wrote in those seven wow. years. Oh, and yeah, that yeah. helped <laughs> me to recapture the feeling of the moment because I could see you know, how I described and I tried to convey things that happened to me at that time to friends and family. Yeah. Oh. And, and Katie, you know, you, you document your public life at least, or, and, mm. and part of your personal life, of course, on social media. Is that something, you know, talking about the balance of the public and the private, you know, for both of you, of course, you know, you're both public private individuals. I mean, you know, I can walk down the street and nobody will care, but both of you have, you know, you have that, right. You, you are recognized. So how do you, how do you look at social media in that particular way? And of course, this is a broader thing because it's, it's applicable to kids. It's applicable to adults in all sorts of spheres. How much do we share of who we really are? How much do we keep right. private? How do you, how do you view that the, the way that you use it? Um, you know, when I first started social media, I was very, um, sort of standoffish with it. You know, I didn't want people to know so much about me. Um, I think that the reason being that I was so insecure in the beginning of it, and I really, um, doubted what I had to offer and what people would want to know about me. And I think as I've gotten older now, I think it's 15 years later or something like that. I think what's happened is I realized that to some extent, the life experiences that I've had, um, it could, like Samantha was saying, you know, you, you, there are people that are motivated by the things that we do and that do, do, you know, I, I posted something the other day about how, you know, people, people tell me that the characters that I've played are these strong women and that they're role models and that I'm a role model. And I used to doubt that. And I think as I've gotten older, I've realized that, that it is a choice to be that. And, and, um, and so I, I want people to see my life to a certain extent. Um, and so I choose to share certain moments because I feel like they're learning moments for me. 
And if it's a learning moment for me, perhaps it would be something for someone else. Um, you know, my fiance and I did have this conversation the other day about children though. And, you know, we now trying to have children have, have had the discussion of that. We don't want to put our children on social media because it's not a choice that they've made. Um, and, and so it's, you have to be careful what you give people because you want to give people all of you, but that's not healthy. You know, it's, it's too much. And so for me anyway, and so there are pieces of me that I keep restrained, um, which is hard because I'm tech, I'm usually an open book, <laughs> but, um, but I do, I, I do keep pieces of me restrained, but I try to learn from my fans and, and then give them pieces of me that I think can help them learn as well. And, and, and it's just sort of, you know, all life on one thing. So that's the thing yeah. is that, yeah, I don't know. I, I enjoy it, but I also, there's a part of me that's scared of it sometimes too. Right. But there are things you do, you know, outside of your, your working life, of course, to do with charity. Um, you, you know, you can, again, I mean, it's true of both of you in some ways, you have the power to use one persona to make an impact elsewhere. So how, how do you, yeah. how do you see that? Right. I mean, you've got, you've got an audience, you've got, you've got a, you've got people who listen to you. That's really important to me. My mom always said that if you're if you're blessed enough to to have a lucky life or a life that's filled with with health and happiness and and financial stability and a roof over your head and food on your table, then you have a responsibility to help other people. Um, and so it, it's always been a part of my life since I was a young kid. That that you know um, um, I want to as much as I can possibly try and leave the, the world a better place, even if that's just a tiny little piece, you know? And you, Samantha, of course, you know, we, we talked very briefly about, um, you know, before you came on, but we talked about it when we were discussing beforehand, you know, politics, for example, other areas where, again, I mean, I know that, and, and this isn't, you know, this is separate, you know, but Tim, Tim Peake, of course, was asked what was his opinion on Brexit? And of course, it's not something you know, working in the positions that we are in a, in an agency, which is 22 countries, and, and in his case, the UK is part of it. So do you find, is that easy to resist that, that kind of pressure to be, to, to go outside the boundaries? Um, because people value your opinion on one thing, they want to hear your opinion on another, right? Right. No, I, I find it pretty easy. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty reserved person. So I, um, for me, it's the opposite. I kind of have to overcome uh, you know, uh, or, or make an effort to, to go beyond those boundaries that you mentioned, or I would have if I, if I, I would have to make an effort if I yeah. chose to do that. So it, it's actually pretty easy and I'm, I'm, I'm very well guarded when it comes to my private life and my, my family. Um, that's really my instinct. So yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, try to keep that separate, you know, <laughs> there is my job as an astronaut and I, sure. Very happy to to share as much as I can about that. In fact, I I, I think it's it's my responsibility to do so, um, and I, I shared a lot when I was training for my mission and during the mission. Um, but after that uh, transition, you know, I, I I had no difficulties, you know, switching that off and, yeah. and transitioning to a more private type of life. And again, I will, you know, as soon as I start training again for my next mission, then of course I will go back to. To sharing but it's more like sharing that story because i think yeah. that needs to be a shared story you know I, as, as i said before i consider myself so lucky that i'm i am the one that actually gets to go to space um but it's it's really a story that belongs to to humanity and so there is a responsibility to share it um but certainly not my private life or my yeah. family, you know? but but then there are things that fit in between i mean the, the one for example which i know i've talked to you and to others in, in the astronaut corps you know how can you use your platform to talk about things which we do in the agency but not directly that the astronauts do so things like climate change for example yeah. uh and so i haven't you know your book hasn't been i haven't got a copy of it yet so i need to read what's in there but you're looking down on the earth you're seeing the earth changing the so-called overview effect do you does that you know, does that fit in? Is that a responsibility then to talk about things which are not specific to your mission, but, you know, how you see your perspective in, in the universe as a human being? Yes, but I mean, that that's very much related to the work we do as, um, you know, a little bit as astronauts, but certainly as an agency, right? I mean, we, yeah. we are not, yeah. uh, we're not only responsible to share our 
personal journey as astronauts, but but certainly also to 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 share and disseminate what what we do at, uh, at as a space agency. So that's that's definitely part of the job. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. and yeah. I I care very much about it. <laughs> That makes absolute sense. You know, um, I, I wondered, um, just shifting gears just a little bit. Um, you know. Sorry, we have a we have a guest, so if she oh, makes. Oh, oh, there she is! I apologize. She's right there. Now she needs to talk to us. <laughs> absolutely brilliant. We know, well, finally, well, well, number one, Mark, when you talked about the pre-show chat that we had, I fully believe that you were going to say, "So, what's your favorite dinosaur?" Because that was. That was the other thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, dogs are not descended from dinosaurs. Do you have any chickens in the back garden or something? We can talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I want chickens. I want them so bad. I, I have this. <laughs> speaking of how dreams change, I have this dream now to move out to the middle of nowhere and have chickens and dogs and cows and I don't know. <laughs> so, so, so Katie, I uh, uh, actually uh, uh, I saw something um, you know online. Um, that you actually had an experience aboard a fighter jet with the Blue Angels, you know, um, if uh, viewers aren't oh. familiar with that, you know, just like this, this incredibly uh, esteemed, you know, US Navy display team and so on. Did, what was that experience like? And did that give you like a, a different perspective on Starbucks role and perhaps some of the things that Samantha's experienced as well? So going up, Brandon was, I forget his last name, I should remember this, but Brandon was the, the pilot that took me up and, and um, it was still hands down one of probably the coolest thing I've ever done in my entire life. So um, I actually am scared of flying. I am not a good flyer. Um, <laughs> so um, it's usually I look around for someone on a plane that's more scared than me because then I become like a caretaker and I'm good. And I'm like, oh, I got you, sweetie. It's totally fine. We're good. Pla <laughs> planes are made to stay in the sky. Um, so, um, but when I went up with the Blue Angels, I was told that most people, most civilians either pass out or throw up. So I was like, I will not do either. I will stay, you know, awake and I will not vomit. Those will just, my only goal was just to do that. Um, and we pulled some pretty crazy G's actually. We broke the sound barrier and like, um, it was pretty crazy though, but I had my, um, my hick method down. I don't know if, you know, the, if you've learned this, but basically now the, the blue angels, because they fly in such beautiful formation, they get so close together. They cannot be in the, the machine that helps them the, the air, um, the blood circulation they have to do it themselves. And so they, they squeeze their legs and they do this thing with their stomachs where they, they breathe and they shut, they, they push down and they like, they go hick, 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 hick. <laughs> and they do this while they're flying to keep the blood flowing so they don't pass out. And I was hicking my head off. I was so like, we, 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 we pulled some G's upside down and we were flying inverted with a naval um, uh, carrier that was on the water. And we were going so fast upside down. And I just remember thinking, don't you dare pass out, Katie. Do not, don't you dare pass out. Starbuck would not pass out. And I'm like, hick, 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 hick. <laughs> Um, but it was, it was absolutely one of the coolest things I've ever done in my entire life. I, hands down, I, I just, it, it blew me away, blew me away. Unbelievable. I'm, I'm really surprised to be, we, I can, I'm a, I've, I've actually flown in a G suit. I've flown a fast fighter. I was in the RAF when I was younger, but I, why Samantha, would you not wear uh, a, um, a yeah, G suit I, when, when? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm surprised. Um, are they just, they said, are they just being macho? Are they just being hardcore or something? No, the reason is, reason, they, but... yeah, they said that because they, they rest their hands when they fly and when their wings are so close to each other, they're resting to get into that formation. And it's such a small movement that if the G suit, I guess the G suit could actually make them flinch. And so they don't, they cannot wear the G suits. Hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah, it might be a way particular way that they keep their hand in there. I mean, and definitely other aerobatic teams, they wear G-suits. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but I mean, the G-suit only takes away about one G in your perception. So oh, you, still really? have to do, you, you still have to do your hick, hick, hick. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help you all the way. <laughs> I was just, I was literally hicking so hard. Like, <laughs> like, and it and, started and, to go gray, 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 gray. And I was like, hey, 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 hey
Yeah, well done. <laughs> and so the bottom line is you didn't pass out and you didn't throw up, right? No, I didn't. I was so close, especially when we came to land, because I guess they, they pull a bunch of G's and then they turn really quick to land. And I almost, I almost passed out as we were landing, but I managed to hick as hard as I could. So, <laughs> well, you know, I, I wonder if uh, to, to, to broach a, a, a real left turn, but I think, you know, pertinent to both of your experiences so much is you both had incredibly physical roles, you know, um, I mean, Starbuck just seemed like such an involved character because there were so many action scenes, there was so much that you were doing, but also Samantha, I mean, you're talking about staying fit aboard the space station, the physical demands of doing that. I mean, the regime, the discipline to kind of stay on top of that, I mean, must have been pretty next level. And from what I understand, you know, an, an astronaut's training um, is, is nothing short of uh, impressive in order to kind of stay well while you're up in orbit. Right, I mean, it's, um, uh, I, I would probably have to, <laughs> um, it, you're basically working out about two and a half hours per day, but it's not really different than going to the gym or anything like that. Uh, the, the only difference is that you, you have to be really, really diligent about doing it every single day or, you know, or at least, let's say, six days a week. And it's not so much about you know, being able to function in space, um, except if you're doing a spacewalk. And for that, you definitely need to be very strong and, you know, you, you definitely need your strength. Um, but aside from that situation, actually being in space is quite easy from a physical point of view because everything is weightless, right? So it, it, it's quite effortless. Um, the problem is that you're not going to stay in space forever. <laughs> Eventually you want to come back and there's gravity waiting for you. Um, and so in order for you to be able to function when you come back, uh, you, you really need to work out every day. Plus, it's not only about your cardio and your muscles, but it's also about your bones. So basically, you know, by working out, especially the high loaded uh, weight lifting, you know, we do weight lifting and weightlessness, which sounds very easy, I know, but <laughs> But there's a trick we have we have a machine that actually gives you all the resistance that you need so that and and also this running on the treadmill so hitting with your heel at every step that kind of sends a message to your bones about hey hey you know we, we still need you you know don't, don't you know we, we we cannot just lose bone mass and and that helps immensely in maintaining bone mass and it's actually one of the um, you know benefits i guess from from astronauts having been in space for for you know, so long now, is that we, we really know how helpful that is for maintaining bone mass. And that's not only helpful for astronauts, but it's really also helpful for people, um, especially, you know, some of older women who are uh, at risk of osteoporosis, like, you know, some serious weightlifting really helps a lot. Mm. One of the topics you and I have talked about in the past is this thing of measuring body core temperature as well, because of course, in space, I mean, people think, well, you just get cool because, yeah, except there's no convection, right? Because there's no gravity. And one of the major cooling routes for people sitting on a, on a stationary bike or in the gym is that the warm air flows upwards. So keeping cool on the space station is a, you know, it's a challenge as well, right? I mean, is it simply fans? Is it just that having air blown at you the whole time? Um, which... Yes, I mean, we, we, when we do cardio, we definitely have an extra fan just blowing at you. But uh, generally speaking, yeah, you're right. There is no natural convection, but there is a lot of forced convection. We have like dozens of fans that make sure that the air is circulating all the time through the space station. And it's not only for temperature, but, you know, you, you have to make sure that the um, atmosphere throughout stays homogeneous in terms of oxygen content, CO2 contents. If, if there was no circulation at all and you would be breathing, eventually you would be in this big CO2 bubble that you've exhaled. And that, of course, would be even be dangerous. Um, well, so there are very strict requirements. Yeah. It's a metaphor about... for the Earth. We're, we're in the bubble of the CO2 we all breathed out, right? So, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, on, on, on the space station, we. Um, you know, we, we just make sure that there's a constant flow of air and then there are equipment that takes that CO2 out and injects fresh oxygen in the, in the air. Yeah. And, and, and Katie, for you as an actor, is it, you know, it's the sort of the classic thing we read about, you know, an actor has to get fit for a certain role and then they just, you know, 
slob out for the next year and then they have to lose 20 kilos again i mean i you know it's, of course it's a stereotype but how do you stay fit for something which is so demanding as alex was saying it was yeah. a physically demanding role right so for me i you know i'm blessed that i was i was raised um in a family that was very active and so being physically fit or at least moving every day is something that comes very easily to me um so I don't really have to struggle against that, which is a huge barrier for so many people. Um, but as far as the roles are concerned, you know, I've always just, I grew up watching science fiction and action movies and there weren't a lot of strong women. So I grew up wanting to be Bruce Willis, you know, like that's who I wanted to be because he seemed so physically capable. And then, you know, we were lucky to have Linda Hamilton and Sigourney Weaver and, and Lucy Lawless and like these women that looked like they actually could exist in this world. And I think that that was the main thing for me when I got into this business was that I didn't want to be dinky. I didn't want to look like I couldn't do it in reality. So I actually just started doing it in reality and, and making sure that I could physically do what my characters were doing. Um, and it just sort of kept me physically fit, you know, um, it's, it's, um, it's one of the things about the business though, right? Cause it's mostly just about aesthetic, but for me, it's, it's about, it really is about movement and it's about pushing weight and actually being strong. And I think that that's something, talk about fan base and, and trying to impart things that are actually healthy and beneficial to other people. I, I, I constantly try to convince women to be strong, you know? Um, that it's not necessarily about their aesthetic, but it's just about being capable. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, how, how much liberty do you have as an actor to decide what kind of body your character is going to have? So I think that um, because I'm so pig-headed, <laughs> I've always had complete control over what my characters look like. You know, when I first moved to California and started acting when I was 18, I was considered chubby and was, was constantly told to lose weight. Um, and I think just because I have a, a problem with authority, I always said no. Um, <laughs> and, and so what that did was it put me into a different category of, of I think, actor because I wouldn't lose weight. I didn't want to get really skinny. Um, and so, it, it, you know, I, I constantly choose, excuse me, um, so I do choose what, what they look like. You know, I did a whole episode on my YouTube channel about getting ready for a role. And so many people were like, I can't believe they told you to lose weight. And I was like, they didn't tell me to do that. I chose to do that because I wanted my character to look, um, um, she's an astronaut and she was coming out of cryo sleep. And I wanted her to look a little dehydrated. I wanted her to look very controlled. She's a person that is so concise and controlled with her food and everything that's happening in her life. And so I wanted her to look that way. And I wanted her body because her, her body was the first thing that you see on camera. I wanted the audience to immediately associate her control with the way that she looked. And so it was a very specific decision for myself. And so I did lose body fat to get there. Um, but nobody told me to do that. So um, I think that because of the way my brain works, if somebody told me to do it, I probably would have. <laughs> I, I would have been like, so I can have burgers and beer every day. Perfect. <laughs> so that's that, that, that bring, brings me to a question. I mean, I'm not sure how we're doing on time exactly, but you know, new roles. I mean, we've just heard this week you have a new role coming up, which is of you know great interest to the science fiction community. Let's say. Um, Oh, the, so, the, the, the rumor mill about you can't say oh I it's the rumor mill i mean i just i believe it's true right then. i'm sorry you're breaking up i can't hear you <laughs> <laughs> okay all right i thought i thought maybe there was an announcement but uh we'll, we'll leave it with the rumor mill for the time being cool okay but where you know so you but obviously Battlestar is a long time ago now it's 15 years and it's fantastic to yeah. see the cast coming together and still and, and recording with, with trisha the uh, the podcast that she's been yeah. doing for the last few months, but you've done much more. So um, tell us a bit more about the the things which are coming up, which you can tell us about. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, you know, I've, I've been blessed. And, and this is one of the things Samantha was saying earlier is that, you know, preparedness and drive and ambition are just part of it. You know, the, there takes a, a lot of luck and opportunity as well. And and um, I was in the right place at the right time. And, and I've, I've continued to be in the right place at the right time throughout my career, which is, I'm really blessed. Um, 
so I have worked consistently, but, um, right now we're just trying to get the second season of another life done, <laughs> which is, um, because of COVID has been a challenge, but it looks like we're going to start working here in the next two weeks, which I'm really excited about, not only for myself, for a sem some semblance of normalcy, but for our crew, you know, we have a, the film industry employs 12 million people worldwide. I mean, there's a lot of people, I, that actually might only be in the United States, to be honest, but it, it, a lot of people depend on this industry for for security and for financial stability and for for their jobs like we need to get that aspect in a safe manner back and going the 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 arts i think people sometimes dismiss the arts as as whatever people would be fine but i think that what they don't realize is how many industries actually depend on the film industry um and so i'm really excited that we're getting back up and going um and then um, we, um, uh, the YouTube channel, constantly putting out as much content as we can safely shoot during COVID. Um, some some other projects coming this year. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and um, you know, my fiance and I are um, in the process of uh, creating a couple movies that we've sold together. So um, we've got a lot going on. Um, but only one thing I can talk about. So. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I, yeah, I spoke out of time. But, uh, but people have, no, people no, have the internet. People yeah, have the internet. They can go and find out, right? So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and I, I suppose, uh, yeah, moving on. So, so Samantha, what, what is next for you? We, uh, we hinted on the book that you have, um, you know, coming up soon and so on. But, you know, uh, uh, you, you've also remained incredibly active. Yes, yeah, so, um, well, the, the, the biggest thing, of course, is that I, I hope to start uh, training for, for my next mission as, uh, as soon as possible. So who knows, maybe uh, next year this time I will be in training for, for another mission to the um, ISS, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, in the meantime, I've been mainly, for the last couple of years at least, I've been uh, very much involved with uh, the next thing in, in, in space exploration, which is... Um, Gateway. It's like an infrastructure that is going to be built in the next uh, years um, and will orbit not around Earth this time, not like the International Space Station, but actually around the moon. Uh, so like, you know, thousand times uh, further out there. Uh, first modules will probably launch in 23. Um, of course, you know, NASA has this uh, objective at this deadline of also putting boots on the surface of the moon by, by the end of, uh, of 24, which is uh, of course possible, wow. but certainly a very aggressive schedule. Um, and then after that, probably 25, 26 ish, we will add to this gateway in orbit around the moon, a um, European led module, which is called IHAB, International Habitat. Um, and so I've, I've been very much involved with that for the last uh, couple of years. So we have a mm. brilliant team of uh, engineers at, uh, at our center in Holland, ESTEC, who are, um, you know, following that. And I've, you know, joined them, uh, trying to bring in a little bit the crew perspective, the perspective of somebody who has actually lived and worked in space. Um, so, you know, whenever there's something where that is especially relevant, then I can be like a little bit of a point of contact, you know, especially if you're talking crew systems, you know, how are people going to sleep, how are they going to wash, how they're going to use the toilet, uh, how, how they're going to function and work up there. Those are the things where I can be, hopefully, a little bit helpful. <laughs> The other thing you've been working on in the last few years, of course, with Matthias, Matthias Maurer, who now has an assigned flight, uh, finally, um, is with the Chinese. And so what can you tell us about how that might go? Because, of course, in the US, US can't work with uh, the Chinese space program because of that, you know, of the wall effectively. Uh, whereas in Europe, we can, you know, we can work with everybody at the moment. So what, what's the status there at the moment? So the, I, I, I guess the, the, the biggest event that we have in terms of cooperation with the Chinese so far was that uh, Matthias and I had a chance to actually go over there to, to China a couple of years ago and to participate in a sea survival exercise with them. So it was uh, actually really cool because uh, we, we spent about, yeah, was it 10 days or maybe even two weeks um, in this uh, training location on the sea. 
um, and, and and it was like then a, a multi you know there was like preparation leading up to it and then a multi-day uh, training event and we were all living together in this uh, compound with the with the Chinese uh, astronaut community and uh, it was just a blast to uh, maybe you know of course you know my Chinese and Matthias Chinese is you know definitely needs some some improvement especially two years ago and how probably got a bit better um, but uh, but still I mean I I think we um, we were able to to build some budding friendships and to to really feel how you know in the end this 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 whole international astronaut community, you know, it, it's like just one big family because in the end mm. you're bound by this goal of flying to space and this yeah. passion and this very <clears throat> special life that you that you lead. So that was because one of the one of the questions we get asked a lot um, in episodes like this, but in other places, you know, are we seeing a new space race? Are we seeing between perhaps China and the United States? Are we seeing what was there between the Soviet Union and America? And my reply to that, and it's I think it's similar to what you've just said, is no, actually we don't view it that way anymore. It's you know, there's there's may, way more players involved. Uh, I mean, Europe's there now with its own astronaut corps. You know, there's there's still Russia, there's China, there's India potentially. Um, so how do you see that kind of being at, at the cutting edge of it, right? I mean, there's the whole political side, but you will be working and living with these people. Right. I mean, there are no concrete plans or anything like that, right? Don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't want to give the impression that, no, you know, no. one of us is flying with uh, the Chinese any anytime soon. Uh, although, you know, that might happen, uh, but don't ask me if, if indeed it will happen or, or when. Um, you know, what we do is very much working level. I mean, we, we work with, uh, again, the other astronauts and then the European Astronaut Center. We have a working group that I have also been part of uh, that, you know, has tried to lay the, the, the groundwork at a working level so that, you know, if, uh, if, if at a higher level one day it gets decided that uh, this indeed will happen, then we are ready. Because I mean, in, in, in international cooperation is, 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 is great and it has enabled a very robust uh, exploitation of the space station for the last uh, 20 years. I mean, we have enormously benefited from it, but it doesn't come for free. You know, if you, we, we joined m myself and, and my colleagues in 2009 and, and it all was working very smoothly like clockwork, you know, the, the international partnership of the space station. But if you talk to the previous generation of astronauts, you know, people who were already in the astronaut corps in the 90s or were already working with NASA in the 90s, where the US-Russian cooperation was just starting. I mean, it was a lot of work. I mean, it was like big teams of people moving over to Moscow, staying there for tours of three, four months, uh, you know, agreeing on stuff, translating all the documentation, the manuals, uh, agreeing on how you would translate a thing so that you wouldn't have like one Russian word translating in four different ways and making it very confusing. I mean, that is a lot, a lot of work. And, you know, there is that part. And then there is the, the familiarity that you have to build over many years just by working with people, but not only working with them, also, you know, going out to get a beer after work or have dinner together or have some vodka together or whatever, you know, <laughs> that, that familiarity, that kinship is, is incredibly important and it doesn't come for free and it doesn't come quickly, it takes time. Yeah. 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 You know, and I, and I wonder, you know, perhaps just symbolically beyond the science, you know, beyond, you know, the, the, the very important functions, you know, I think there's still something fundamentally important for people to see, which is nations who are cooperating, you know, um, you know, just whatever other divisions, you know, may exist, that we can work together as a species, perhaps now with this pandemic more than ever, you know, that's really how we should see ourselves, you know, just uh, because it's what's necessary in order to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I guess what I, what I try to convey, and I, I, I tried, and I, I might even reiterate it again, is that it, it's it's incredibly beneficial and it's even probably necessary to serve to the long-term survival of our species on, on this planet, but it's not easy. You know, it, it, it takes work. It takes a conscious effort. It takes a willingness to overcome difficulties. It does not come for free. So because sometimes I have the feeling that there is this fairy tale approach of like, you know, oh, let's all be friends <laughs> and work together. 
But the truth of the matter is, it is different cultures, it is different worldviews, sometimes it is different languages. So it takes work and difficulties are part of it. And you need to be able to overcome that, those with, you know, goodwill and, and hard work and not, mm -hmm. you know, just be disappointed and it's like, oh, then it doesn't work, I will just drop it. No, mm -hmm. that, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Well, in many ways, I, I can't think of a better uh, expression of what Battlestar Galactica did, you know, beyond the uh, obvious plot premise, which was it threw people together into an adverse situation and it, it, you know, people had to work together in order to survive, Katie. And I suppose that's, do you think that's why people really resonated with the show so deeply? Because it was a believable humanity? I think so. Um, you know, I, I think that, sorry, you guys froze for like a good 30 seconds there. I was like, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think that Battlestar Galactica resonated with people because it, there was something for everyone. You know, there were no clear cut, in my opinion, villains um, on Battlestar. Um, and I think that that everyone was really just trying to survive at their core, including the Cylons. Um, and, and so I think that, that the, one of the things that's so important that we touched on before is that, you know, it's going to take <clears throat> a massive amount of cooperation for our world and our countries to work together to, to, for the survival of the human race. And I think that that's part of what Battlestar represented was a coming together of, of a bunch of different people for a common goal. Mm. I think, you know, to pick up on, on that topic, one of the things which we talked with, with Tamo and Trisha about, of course, is that is there's that metaphor uh, or allegory in Battlestar. It's about the fact that the Cylons look just like humans. They're indistinguishable, but we label them as being different. And that's a world we do live in where we say the person from the next village, the person from the next country, the person with a different color skin, the person with a different religion can become our enemy if we choose them to be so. But when we find a way of bringing them into our world they you know so so you know sharon boomer you know was very rapidly taken on as kind of a, a, an honorary human because she displayed the characteristics which brought her in so do you think that that's that's a, an allegory a metaphor i think for me that's why it's still so current because it's such a feature of the world we live in how, how have you seen that play out in the 15 years since the show started um well i i think one of the one of the things that that constantly you know goes through my mind when I think of Battlestar is that you know this has all happened before <laughs> um <laughs> you know um I would like to think that that humanity will get to a point where we see the commonality with each other um but um you know it, it, it is a long road and and we have to take our ego and and um you know take our desire to be right out of things and, and come together and work together. You know, we all, we, we, if we focus on those things that we have in common, we all bleed, we all put our pants on the same way. We all, you know, we all want to be safe and comfortable and loved. And I think if we can focus on those things, um, I think that we'll move forward and that's what Battlestar represents. And that hasn't changed. Sadly, the world is 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 very much the same that it was when we created the show in 2001. Yeah. Very, very, very well said. Well, uh, you know, I'm conscious there's so much more that we could talk about here, but, uh, you know, um, probably wrapping up toward the end, I think it's only fair that we give the final question to one of the viewers, one of the many people that have joined us tonight, you know, and, um, you know, I'm sorry, it, it's the Space Meets Hollywood connection, um, you know, uh, perhaps you can answer together. Um, Samantha, so uh, in the inevitable movie, who would you like to see play yourself? <laughs> oh, no, no I, I wouldn't want to, sorry, say that again. <laughs> who, who's going to play you in the movie? Uh, that comes from Enrica, uh, who's been watching us tonight. <gasps> I definitely oh, no. don't want to be in a movie as a character. <laughs> oh no, you have to be. There has to be a movie with you. You're amazing. I um I, I honestly like the first time that we met a couple years ago, I was so starstruck and so just like, oh my god, this is the coolest thing ever. Like like I pretend to be half as cool as you on camera. <laughs> <laughs> It was like the the, the, the weirdest thing. I mean, I'm somebody who never seriously, because what, what happened is for the, 
people who are watching them, of course, they don't know. So there was this uh, sci-fi convention very close to where I live. And, and so uh, Mark uh, was kind enough to get me uh, involved. And the entire crew of Battlestar Galactica was there. Um, and, and then I'm, I'm like backstage and we're just hanging out. And, and then I see Katie and I'm like, oh my God, there's Starbucks. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, I'm somebody, as I said, you know, I, I grew up as, as a big you know, science fiction fan and astronaut fan and space fan. And before I became an astronaut myself, I would go to places where you could hear astronaut talks and, and things like that. And I, I never, ever, ever like queued to get a picture with one of them because it, it, it's just weird to me. I mean, for me, we're all human beings. Why would I ask somebody for a picture, right? <laughs> And I don't, and then people ask me for pictures all the time and I feel so really weird. And it's like, why do you want a picture with me? I'm just a human being like you. And it's just, and then I'm like, okay, I am going to ask her for a picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone came over to me and they're like, do you know who uh, Samantha Christoph Reddy is? And I was like, um, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? I mean, um, yeah. It was pretty okay. funny. So, so th thank you to the guys at FedCon for letting us do that because I know it's not true yeah. in all sci-fi conventions, right? I mean, they kind of keep the, the scientists and the astronauts. You, you'd be definitely, Samantha, but you know, the scientists don't always get to hang out with the uh, the stars. But I found when we've been there, I mean, it was fantastic talking to Michael Trucco, to Tom O'Penniker and to others because there is that, that's that, you know, there's that desire to know what we do on our side, right? Whether it's science, whether it's the real astronauts. Is yeah. that connection, which is really what Space Rocks is, trying to bring people together, not to say, I'm one of those, I'm one of those, but exactly what you said, Samantha, we're all humans, right? Where is that curiosity? Where is that inspiration? We all do weird things, right? Everybody has a weird <laughs> life of some kind or other, but we share things as well. And, and bringing people together is what Space Rocks is all about. Indeed. Indeed. Very well said. And um, we will get the dinosaur answer out of you guys next time. Okay? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, go and study um, up. Um, I know. I'm going to have to go watch something. Although I think there were dinosaurs in Fern Gully. I just okay, haven't watched right. a movie since I was six. <laughs> there we go. Very, very, fair enough. I have to ask my daughter. She knows everything about dinosaurs. <laughs> On, on behalf of everybody who's been watching, on behalf of everyone at Space Rocks, um, we can't let you go just yet. Um, thank you so much for joining us, but there is one tradition, which Mark always heads up, which uh, we simply have to do. And um, I guess Mark can lead. Indeed. So, I mean, joining everything together, particularly, you know, your love of Star Trek, we start with the Vulcan salute. So, so bring it into camera there. So live long and prosper. And Guys. then more rocks. Oh. So you can do it, Katie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We can give you some glue. There you go. That, that's that's the worst Vulcan salute I've ever seen. Thank you. You've definitely heard so, the one before. Okay, fantastic. I, got it. <laughs> I have to I, I have to keep it special and individualized. So there you go. Very well. That's brilliant. Very thank unique. You. Okay. Well, thank you so much both for joining us. Thank you for sharing your time, and uh, we really hope to see you again sometime soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Bye, 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 bye guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.